This meeting is being recorded. Good evening and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Evanston and a conversation with Judge Lionel Jean-Baptiste. We are pleased to have Helen Gagel as the moderator for our evening. Helen has been very involved in community service and local politics and has served on a number of local boards, including the League of Women Voters. Helen has worked for a variety of nonprofits in the healthcare, economic development, and older adult services arenas, including as the first executive director of the North Shore Village Network. In all of these endeavors, she has made very good use of her degree from Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism as a communicator and an advocate. Helen, will you now introduce our speaker and we'll get started. Happy to do so. I hope, uh, it looks like Jennifer hasn't been able to mute everybody. I will ask you again I'm, to I'm, please mute yeah, yourselves. I'm gonna do I'm going to mute doing it now. now. I'm going to mute now, but you'll have to unmute yourself, Helen. Okay. okay. Go for it. Okay, I am unmuted. Um, and as soon as I introduce the judge, he will need to unmute himself. Um, okay, I, our speaker tonight, our guest tonight is a man of many firsts and achievements. As many of you no doubt know, he was the first Haitian American alderman in Evanston, actually the first municipal elected official in the state of Illinois as a Haitian American. He is also the first Haitian American to be sworn in as a judge of the circuit court. He came to this country at age 14, oldest of six children, the only boy in the family. His sister, Lucy Latour Sims, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, was quoted in the Evanston Roundtable recently about her brother, and she said his reputation is one of, and I quote, selflessness, mentorship, relationship building, and resistance to injustice. She said she and her sisters were inspired by their brother's student activism at Evanston Township High School and later at Princeton University. Quoting again, not only was he the protective older brother as we grew up, but he was also our mentor and our teacher. He made sure we knew our history. He taught us to love ourselves and our people near and far. He taught us to celebrate our Haitian culture and this Evanston community we call home. Quite a testimonial from a sister, and you probably didn't even have to pay her to say that. <laughs> um, he was president of the ETHS Student Council. He played on the 1970 state championship soccer team. As I noted before, he's a graduate of Princeton where he met his wife, Lenore. They are the, the parents of three children, grandfather of three. After Princeton, he taught school in New York City, uh, elementary and community college, later became director of special housing for New York City uh, where he served the homeless and provided emergency housing. Returned to Evanston and enrolled at Chicago Kent School of Law in 1986, from which he graduated in 1990. His public service career in Evanston includes 10 years as alderman of the second ward, where he was recognized as a hard worker, a strong negotiator, and a voice of fairness and reason. While on city council, he was instrumental in establishing Evanston's minority-owned, women-owned, and Evanston Business Enterprises Development Committee, as well as the city's youth services outreach team. And for a very current issue, he really helped lay the foundation for Evanston's reparations program two decades ago when he advocated a resolution to study rep reparations in the city back in 2002. Recognizing his service to our community, the city council in just last December, 2021, adopted a resolution for an honorary street name 
in his honor. It'll be on McDaniel between Dempster and Crane. I went by there today. The sign's not up yet. Maybe they're waiting for better weather. Absolutely. Um, he is also a tireless advocate for the people of his home country, active in many um, organizations, <laughs> and is founder and past chairman of the Haitian Congress to Fortify Haiti, a founding member of the Haitian Relief Fund of Illinois, also a founder and past president of the Haitian American Lawyers Association of Illinois. I could go on, but it's time to talk to our guest. Um, you might notice in my background, I found uh, an illustration of the Haitian flag coupled with the US flag, and we are going to address um, that relationship in our conversation. Um, I, the first question I'd like to ask you, Judge Jean-Baptiste, is how did your experience of leaving Haiti and coming to the United States, Evanston in particular, inspire and lay the groundwork for your um, involvement in public service? Thank you very much, um, Helen. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you uh, to the lead of voters of Evanston for this invitation. And the last time I crossed path with you all, I was running for, I think, Alderman, probably the last uh, effort before I became judge, where you cross-examined me, made sure that uh, I was answering your questions. So I hope you're going to be friendlier today during this discussion. So, um, well, the question that you raised about, you know, how being raised as a Haitian born in Haiti, how does that impact what, who I am today, basically? And I can say to you that it's, it's fundamental. Um, I, my first 14 years of life was in Haiti, and this is where I was very entrenched in family, uh, and I continue to be. Uh, and it was an extended kind of relationship with family members where cousins were sisters and brothers. I lived with grandmothers, aunts, uncles. Um, everybody, everybody worked together to try to um, make sure that uh, we were able to, um, to live together. Um, my uh, mother is from a small town of La Vallée, and um, she, La Vallée Jacques Mel, and when she came to Port-au-Prince as a young woman, she was um, able to work and in the process build relationships, um, and I was the first born of my mother and uh, my father, uh, who didn't raise me, I was raised by my stepfather. But fundamentally, the, the value system we were imbued with was one of really selflessness and humility and, and a can-do attitude. Um, we, didn't, we were not defined by material wealth until somebody you know, showed me that I was, I might have lacked certain material things. I never perceived myself as a poor person, but we didn't have anything. Um, my mother was a uh, working class, um, but I was also deeply uh, entrenched in my history. In Haiti, the educational system that we went through um, imbued us with the opportunity to almost memorize our history. And it is a, a glorious history uh, where a small nation uh, was able to be formed from the struggles of Africans who were enslaved, who were able to pull themselves together after some 300 years of enslavement. Uh, and, and a period of enslavement where Haiti was the richest colony in the whole Western hemisphere. Uh, France depended on it significantly, almost one out of every four French 
uh, person um, made their living from commodities imported from Haiti from um, the enslavement of the people there. But in 1791, the people of Haiti had enough of that and they pulled themselves together and wage uh, an organized resistance. Um, I heard a, a, a professor from Northwestern during a, a Black History Month lecture said that for every minute that uh, African people were enslaved, they were resisting. And, but this level of resistance was organized from 1791 to 1804. There was a protracted struggle waged and Haiti became independent on January 1st, 1804. So that kind of history uh, imbued in Haitians the pride uh, for overcoming obstacles and moving their, their society forward. Uh, at that time too, um, Haiti was the second independent nation in the Western hemisphere. Haiti had, uh, Haitians had participated in the effort of uh, the American people to try to free themselves and become independent. Uh, Battle of Savannah, uh, where uh, Christophe and others participated um, Haiti also participated upon its liberation in helping um, Simon Bolivar and others in Latin America gain independence of, of various nations. They provided material wealth, um, logistical help uh, to, to move the process forward for them with one condition, that they would free the slaves. Um, that would end slavery on, on, in those territories. Um, so with that kind of uh, background, with the leadership of Desalines, Christophe, I'm sure you guys have heard, Toussaint Louverture, um, young folks going to school learned about their contribution. Uh, we also learned that uh, we made a significant contribution to other contrib contributions to the United States by the defeat of France, because we ended up expelling France from the Western Hemisphere when they sold uh, the Louisiana Territory to the United States, which now encompasses 13 states. It's not just the state of Louisiana. Uh, it was a significant uh, uh, contribution, uh, but the United States, which was leading the uh, slavocracy that I call it in the Western Hemisphere, was um, reluctant to recognize Haiti as an independent nation. So after 1804, Haiti was suffered an embargo uh, and the United States did not recognize Haitian independence until 1860. Um, 1862 on the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States. Wow. All of that was interrelated and interdependent. And, um, you know, so it is that kind of background that assisted me in trying to, in informing me as a, as a human being. You know, I, mm -hmm. I um, and we never really, in HC, while, you know, a material wealth, might have been lacking, but um, we didn't suffer from a psychosis of feeling ourselves to be uh, inferior to anyone. Uh, we were human beings, able and capable as anybody else. So those things shaped me with family values to be who I am today. Such a proud history that not enough of us know very much about in this country. So. Thank you for that. There are ties, as some of us know, between um, Haiti and Chicago, including um, the man now recognized as the founder of Chicago, the first non-Native American, um, Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable, who was, um, his spouse was a Potawatomi, um, member of the Potawatomi Nation. Uh, and the ties through World's Fairs and other things. And there are many organizations now, and you told me about some of them yesterday and hope we'll, hopefully we'll get to them and we'll put something in the chat as we go along for people who want to 
understand, know where they can uh, make contributions to some of the issues that um, Haiti is confronting now, you know, jumping ahead from that proud history you talked about, just within the last year, the president of Haiti was assassinated in July, a devastating earthquake in August. Haitian migrants detained at the U.S. border throughout that time. Um, what, what would you like us to come away from tonight's discussion with? Um, what do we need to know and understand about what is happening in Haiti now? Our duty as Americans to help and respond. And then we can also get into support for the Haitian community that is already here in this country. That's a lot to um, throw at you, but take it away. Okay. Well, I think that the what we see, uh, what we saw recently, the massing of 15,000 Haitians and others under the Del Rio Bridge at the border of Texas and Mexico was the manifestation of a deeply rooted kind of ill that is going on um, between Western nations and uh, various nations that have been um, underdeveloped over a period, period of time. Um, Vice President Harris, when she was uh, traveling in Latin America and Central America to try to talk to the various nations about migration, uh, made a, a revelation that uh, uh, many of us already know, that it is really the impoverishment of those nations that has led to you know, the exodus from those nations seeking to come to the great nations such as United States that have been enriched from the impoverishment. There's, a, there's a, a direct relationship between what, when we look, we see uh, poor nations and we look and we see rich nations. Uh, the United States didn't come to be as rich as it, is, as it is without the exploitation of many nations, including native people, uh, but also uh, the constant um, exploitation of a number of other nations. And, and in Haiti, in particular, uh, not only did the U.S. Um, you know, benefit, but U.S. also underdeveloped a nation like, like Haiti. Um, and many of you don't know that in 1915, uh, the United States invaded and occupied Haiti until um, in 1915 until 1934. So during this occupation, the United States replaced whoever was in power at that time, uh, organized a military uh, that was beholding to it principally, to the United States, and it also rewrote the Haitian constitution. In fact, you know, uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, was in power at the time. And the period of time that during this occupation, the sovereignty of the nation was significantly compromised. So you ask, you may ask, well, what is that? It happened in 1915 to 1934. So what happened? that we think is cataclysmic like that, but it's, it's part of an ongoing kind of relationship because prior to 1915, uh, earlier, some 20 years after Haiti had, be, had become independent, United States had uh, worked with France to force Haiti to pay reparations, to pay 150 million in gold bullion to France for repayment of property loss, that is the, the enslaved Africans that they lost. The 
the value of that uh, payment is in today $22 billion in actuary uh -huh. investment. You have a, a history of complicity. I had already talked about the fact that Haiti was not recognized until um, 1862, 63. And then you have that kind of intervention, interference that was going on um, to impoverish the nation. Haiti took until 1947 to repay that debt. And much of that repayment was money borrowed from the banks of the United States at very high interest rates. And so there was, there was a, a perception. I'm reading a book now called um, The Black Republic. And it's really talking about um, the notion that at the early incep inception of the nation when it first became independent, there was a real fight to prevent the Africans in the United States who were still enslaved and also the, the rest of the Americans who were progressive, who were anti-slavery from not only recognizing, but giving any value to that nation. It was an, inten an, an intentional um, attempt to destroy that nation so that it did, it did not become an example. Um, in fact, it inspired a number of uh, insurrections in the United States, Denmark, VC, mm -hmm. Phil Prosser, and others. But the reality is that kind of interference, that kind of manipulation impoverished Haiti to such an extent that even when it tried to stand up for itself, it was occupied. And subsequent to its occupation, you have the, the support of various regimes that were totally dictatorial. Many of you remember the, the Duvalier regime, the Tonto Makuda, and all the rest of those things. The Duvalier regime was in power from 1957 to uh, 1986, from baby Papa Doc to Baby Doc. And mm. this was a regime that was strictly supported by the United States while it was in power. And if it forced a flight of significant percentage of, of Haitians who were educated, who were um, trying to build society. And so it depleted a lot of forces. So Haiti itself, in terms of not only material consequences, but also in terms of governance, it every time it was one step forward, then it was forced to take two steps back. And we got caught up too in the whole Cold War era where uh, the support of Papa Doc and Baby Doc were justified by the fact that US was in a big war with Soviet Union, a Cold War, and didn't want Haiti to go the way of Cuba. But in the process, you know, the people suffered. So Haiti's governance, not only the, the external factors that I just talked about is significant, but in, inside of Haiti, those who were allowed to rule were those who were complicit in trying to help maintain uh, uh, the subjugation of the people to, and, and those who engage in heavy corruption. So anytime that there was a progressive leader who came forward, um, there was resistance to that uh, progressive leader. So today, if we were to, to move forward quickly, from 86, when Baby Doc was expelled from the nation, Haiti has had seven administrations, seven elections. But almost every one of those elections were dictated by the United States involvement. Uh, if we go, you know, almost every point of the way, the self-determination of the people were interrupted. Um, mm -hmm. The most recent kind of uh, breakdown in, in governance is a, a product of, you know, how, how does elections get done in Haiti? And, and you guys know, we, when we talk about um, interference and intervention, um, in some way or another, that 
no one is allowed to really build independent nations in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the whole Monroe Doctrine dictated that there be, you know, control. And so Haiti is part of that process, but Haitians continue to, to resist uh, subjugation, but has not yet been able to move forward and overcome that. Um, the recent crisis in governance, I know my answers are long, but recent crisis in governance is um, where Jovenel was, was assassinated, um, is a product of the, the, the fight between um, those who would continue to keep the nation in, in a, an impoverished position and those who were trying to uh, free the nation and, and bring about uh, development. The specific struggle that was going on inside of, of Haiti is that um, many of those who were, who are the elite, control significant contracts in Haiti, uh, oil contract, energy contract, um, food, um, the, the ports, and at very high kind of uh, um, very high price for low uh, um, delivery of service and goods. And um, Jovenel was a, a president who stood up against that kind of, uh, that kind of policy. And he made a lot of enemies. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people disagreed with him, but there were a lot of uh, discussion and debate and you know, Haiti didn't give itself a chance to really pursue um, re resolution of its internal uh, problems through through debate and and you know, almost like <laughs> January sixth that we just saw. I don't know where things are going, but uh, without a process to determine to resolve conflicts, then people go to arms, and I think that's what happened in Haiti at this particular point. You know the. I think this country does not like to think of itself as a colonial power, but what you described, we were, we colonized um, Haiti and, and some other Latin American countries as well, practically speaking. Um, Jennifer has put in the chat a message from the uh, Coalition of Haitian um, American Organizations who are both um, generating political action for Haiti and also relief um, and fundraising for um, victims of the earthquake and other disasters. Um, they also have on their website a letter that we are um, encouraged to send to our federal elected officials advocating for um, humanitarian um, relief for Haitian migrants, um, suspension of deportation. It's a long list. I'm wondering, um, Judge, what what is your um, state of mind, state of optimism or pep pessimism about the opportunity for um, enacting some of the corrections, some of the reforms that you and others active in the Haitian community believe to be necessary? Well, you know, um, I think it was Frederick Douglass who said that if there's no struggle, there can be no progress, right? And we all understand that, that we understand that the progress that we've made in this nation, whether it is on the issue of um, mi migrants trying to get fairness, fair immigration laws, whether it is the civil rights movement, whether it's women's rights, that it is the struggle that determines ultimately whether or not we'll get concessions from those who hold these back from, from the people. So I'm optimistic. Um, we did, uh, the Chicago area organizations came together under the banner of a coalition of Haitian American organizations in the Chicago land area after we were hit with one crisis after the other. 
Uh, one of the initial crises was, of course, the crisis in governance with the assassination of the president. Then there was the earthquake, as you spoke about, in, uh, on August 14th, um, where you know more than 2,000 people were killed, others were you know injured, a lot of property damage, and the 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 governance problem in, in Haiti makes it that the infrastructure is a weak, and so earthquake may hit many other places in the world, but in Haiti it devastates because a lot of the uh, structures are, are weak and not up to the kind of code that could allow people to survive. Then, you know, really within a week after that, there was a significant uh, storm that hit where people who were already uh, without shelter were hit with a significant rainstorm. Um, then of course, a month later, we were under the bridge. So the coalition came together uh, to address those three crises. And it pull, pulled together almost 20 organizations in the local area and began to uh, activate some, um, some advocacy. Um, there's a committee that deals with policy and advocacy that's uh, discussing with um, the visited you know, Dick Durbin staff and um, Tammy Duckworth and other congressional leaders and intend to continue to do that to ask for those kind of uh, immigration reforms. One of them is temporary protective status, which was accorded to Haiti Haitians uh, after the first earthquake in 2010. And um, it's been extended a few times because of the activism of people demanding that uh, that temporary protective status be extended. And currently, we are seeing that there are certain concessions being granted in TPS, but the call is for, you know, the kind of humanitarian relief that allows the people who get here to be able to work um, and to be able to access any kind of other relief that they could get. Uh, the uh, coalition is also involved in providing direct service to some of these people. Um, coalition has provided to host families who are accommodating these people some monetary support. Um, the coalition continues to look for pro bono or low bono services from attorneys. So any immigration attorneys who are, who are listening, who are willing to participate you know, could find uh, useful and meaningful work by helping helping these migrants. Um, and we also are working, we had sent relief to those who were victims or who are working with victims of the earthquake as well. So I'm optimistic because, you know, again, it's been the process of our engagement they have moved forward um, the kinds of uh, concessions that Haitian people or any people who may be oppressed get as a result of their work. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, 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 because when I talked earlier about the, the ransom that we had to pay France, uh, I talk about the occupation of Haiti. By the way, at the time of the occupation, Haiti's entire treasury was taken out of the country. Um, there are a number of nations that Haiti has helped. I talked about Latin America, that there's a call for to repay that kind of debt so that Haiti could fight, have the resources to rebuild its, its future. And also a number of uh, um, Haitians and friends and allies are organizing to against the, the interference with the sovereignty of the nation to allow Haitians to be self-determining in terms of rebuilding the future of the nation. Currently, there's a prime minister that has been 
um, given power, but really has not gone through any kind of democratic process uh, where the people has uh, chosen who their leaders might be. Uh, election is supposed to be coming up um, in the year 2022 during this year. Um, so I'm optimistic because there are a lot of folks converging, trying to pull things together. There are various accords that are um, being debated, and but Haitians want to be self-determining so that they can begin to reset the course of the years ahead so that we can stop the bleeding, so to speak. Because in some see right now, you have a lot of security issues. You have a lot of uh, uh, the young people are leaving. They, they, even those who are educated, they, they're seeking a way out. That's why you see the migration, which is not going to stop until there is qualitative change inside of Haiti. And some of us have been talking about the, a Marshall Plan-like initiative to reconstruct, rebuild, and, and reintegrate the resources of the nation that have been uh, spread throughout the world. Uh, one such resource is, is the Haitian diaspora. Uh, mm -hmm. The days of Papa Doc and Baby Doc, people, we've lost significant number of, of our population. There are probably four to five million Haitians who were born in Haiti living outside the country right now. And of course, each of us have our 2.5 children so you've got a lot of Haitian American uh, uh, in our population who are loyal to the Haitian uh, cause um, and are looking for to make their contribution to the nation. Um, right now, too, to let you know, you probably don't know that, there are about 150 Haitian elected officials and ex-elected officials throughout the United States. Um, we recently had the first, um, the second um, Haitian elected to the U.S. Congress. First one was Mia Love from Utah, and there's a, a new lady who was just elected in Florida. And this is a rising kind of tide um, that, so when we talk about optimism, we think that there'll be more and more people at the barricades pushing and pressing to try to bring about some changes. When you mention uh, or talk about the Haitian diaspora here in this country, um, do you see a pathway for people who have come to this country to go back and participate in the recovery and rebuild? Would you yourself ever consider going back? Um, I don't know whether it's the literal going back. My parents and others who came around the time that uh, they came, which were in the 50s, they were not interested in staying. They came to work to try to go back to their country and, leave, and live. But the conditions continue to, to deteriorate. So many of us, my generation and younger, have been organizing to try to find a way to reintegrate into the life of the nation. Um, one of the organizations locally is the Haitian Congress to Fortify Haiti, which fought, waged a seven year struggle to amend the Haitian constitution to grant dual citizenship to Haitians who are being born outside the country and those who are living outside the country and who have become citizens of other countries. I'm, I've become a, a citizen of, of the United States so we have been all looking for a way to work uh, collectively with Haitians in an embrace Haitians inside the country to integrate us into the process. Because as sad as it is, World Bank had a, a, a study that they did, they issued about seven or eight years ago that says that 80% of the Haitians who are credentialized, who were born in Haiti, um, 80% of, of those with credentials who were born in Haiti are living outside the country right now. So that's a significant brain drain. So yes, the call is for reintegration, 
but to the extent that the nation is open to reintegrate in a systematic way, um, that's what many of us want to do uh, to make our contributions. But to the extent that, uh, again, I talked about the, the crisis in governance, um, the elite, many of those in Haiti who have power, perceive that the cake is too small in Haiti for, to accommodate the, the mm -hmm. Haitian diaspora that's ready to come, participate, make their input, and, and make a difference. So there's an effort right now. We're not where we were in uh, the early 2000s. When, when Baby Doc left uh, power in 86, there was a new constitution that was uh, created. And at that time, it excluded the rights of Haitians who had left the country. But now there's a different dialogue right now. There's a different discussion for reintegration. Um, the constitutional amendment allows for the, the children of Haitians born outside the country uh, and wherever they may be, that they are also qualified to have their dual citizenship and Haitians who have gotten citizenship of other nations to also be able to get their citizenship to be able to, to work and assist. The process is, is just, it's just difficult because those inside, many are resisting. Well, and you need and want a, a stable government so that you know if people return to their roots there that they will actually be able to effectively participate and and do what they've they want to do um i'll remind people again if you have a question for judge jean baptiste please put it in the chat we will try to get to them as we go along um talk a little bit about the haitian community here in evanston um its size, what people are involved in. I know that um, obviously you're one of the leaders of that community, but you're not the only one. What what should we know about our, our Haitian community here in Evanston? Well, the Haitian community in Evanston is, is started coming here in the early 50s. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, many of the pioneers uh, were members of my family. Um, the Jean Pauls who were um, at uh, Pittner and Greenwood, um, they, uh, they were the big shoulders on which we, we all leaned. And um, as we know, the pattern in migration is that when one group comes to a particular area, others follow to try to coalesce. So the Jean-Paul house, which was relatively small home, three bedroom, one bathroom, um, some, you know, at any times, the, the, at any time there were 15 to 20 of us who were living there, who uh, if you were not living there, you were stopping by, you were eating, you were celebrating whatever was going on in your life, uh, whether it was a baptism, communion, marriage, and others. So today, that block of uh, Pittner between Greenwood and Dempster is called the Pierre Jean Paul Way. Um, again, um, there were the Grégoire, the Fleury Ma, the Lotour, the, the Jean Baptiste, and others who came through. And many people then dispersed throughout and pursued and grew their family and pursued work. So um, out of that particular beginning um, came a number of others who went to Chicago, some are in Waukegan, some are in other parts of the state in the Chicago area. So there's been an estimation of about 50 to 70,000 Haitians dispersed throughout the Chicago land area. Um, you know, census has not always been exact because uh, migrants, you know, usually don't answer questions. But um, so there are a number of um, 
Haitians have fully integrated into the community and uh, continue to do business. Some are lawyers, some are doctors, uh, some are workers in various hospitals, um, and uh, continue to make their contribution statewide. Uh, you guys know that uh, the attorney general is of Haitian descent. His mother and father was, uh, were Haitian. Kwame Raoul. Um, mm -hmm. uh, others who are doing, you know, there's a, a Haitian restaurant on Howard Street. There are businesses, um, mechanic shop, hairdressers, barber shops. Um, also, um, a number of young entrepreneurs who are doing different things in areas where we hardly hear about in technology and otherwise. There are social workers. There are, you know, others um, who are doing many things. There's um, people that served on the school board um, in uh, District 202. Uh, one of our the president of the Haitian Congress, Marie Toussaint, is on the board of the uh, Oakton Community College. Um, so the community is, is rather dynamic in terms of what it's doing. Uh, people have tended to disperse and people have tended to, when they get an opportunity to move to someplace warmer. So, <laughs> so we have a bunch of enclaves of um, individuals from Chicago who are, who are uh, in Florida, uh, some are in Georgia, some are in, in Texas. Um, Others, you know, there are a couple in Arizona as well. I see that we have some <laughs> ducks in Arizona. So, um, but people have maintained a lot of roots here. There are a lot of pockets of large extended family who are here. Um, what the, the, you talk about leadership, um, the community has always been one that, because we've been driven by the needs of our people. Uh, you have had uh, folks who have created different organizations. There's SOS, who is uh, an organization that provides direct support to some of the people in Haiti. They do an annual Mother's Day, you know, luncheon and send support to Haiti. You have Haitian American Nurses Association um, that uh, recently with the earthquake, uh, sent not only equipment, material uh, support, but travel to bring assistance. Um, we have child concerned Haitian Americans of Illinois who uh, works in the northern part of Haiti, who work with educational building, building schools, and and also uh, medical uh, uh, service. They do an annual trip. Uh, prior to COVID, where they go and bring support. We have, um, as I talked about, the Haitian Congress to Fortify Haiti. There's also a Haitian American elected, uh, Haitian, uh, um, Haitian American Lawyers Association, which has been in existence um, for several decades. Um, it's has its own ebb and flows in terms of its strength um, and weaknesses. Um, there are also Haitian American Professional Association. We have individuals who have radio uh, programs and communication. Uh, when Evanston had its cable uh, uh, station here, uh, a number of folks used to have different programs where they brought news, analysis, and culture. To, to the community. And then we have members of the Haitian American uh, Physician Association that um, are here and also provide significant amount of um, assistance. We have Daughters of Haiti, uh, which is one of the leading um, organization in the coalition um, organizing um, relief, effort and also trying to spread uh, culture 
um, throughout the community to make sure that people are aware of and mm -hmm. just for knowledge to um, to the youth of the community. There's also a museum, it's a Haitian American uh, uh, museum. Museum. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. I just found out about that today, and it sounds right. quite interesting. It's uh, H A M O C is their acronym. Yeah, um, yeah, you might go to their website if anyone's interested. They are open to um, visitors again. Um, Elizabeth Hayford is asking in the chat, can you give us a kind of an update on what what is the state of uh, relief, repair, rebuilding after the um, earthquake last August? Um, the after the earthquake. Um, a lot of support came through to try to help people with uh, recovery uh, and rebuilding because um, a number of people were without shelter. Um, individuals sent um, resources. So there are organizations that are still doing reconstruction. Uh, there's uh, an organization called LACU.org uh, to whom the Haitian Congress has sent a thousand dollars. There's also um, organizations in different parts of that area, Port Salut, um, that um, receive support. There's also organizations in um, in Jeremy, um, in that area. So the support continues, but what happens after the the height? We now August, September, October, November, December, January. Uh, so a number of the, the, the intensive support has retreated. And so people are trying to rebuild their lives. Uh, we continue to, this is one of the crises that we have been working on. We continue to uh, stay in close touch with um, others who are doing some work in that area. One of the organizations is a local organization, laku.org. Um, it's run by an individual who is in construction, who's doing work in that area. So the support continued, but um, Haiti is going to need, with all of the with the multiple crises, uh, we need a reset and a rebuild. That's why we we're talking in terms of a Marshall Plan like a Marshall Plan like. We're not talking about the imposition but we're talking about the assistance, but under the leadership of Haitians to make sure that they get the work done. Many of you probably remember that after the earthquake of 2010, um, all of the discussion about the tremendous amount of money, billions that were supposed to go into Haiti. And many of you probably after you heard that, did not hear that uh, almost 99% of the money that was allocated returned to the United States, returned, left the country. About one penny out of every dollar oh. went to, to rebuild to the government of Haiti. Again, the issue of, you know, of, of, what happens when there's a crisis? Who goes in? Uh, many of you saw President Clinton and various other people going through. Um, and this was not, the rebuilding was not about self-determination of Haitians. Um, when people went in, they went in and benefited, they got paid and they come out. The NGOs, go in, they do their thing and they leave out. So that's why right now the talk is about reset. It's about mm -hmm. some nation for the people of Haiti to try to do something. So some of the work going on, but uh, uh, a lot more needs to be done. I would again um, suggest, take a look at the chat, the post in there from the uh, Haitian um, coalition, uh, which takes you to their website. I think what I hear, if I understand you correctly, you are encouraging um, the rebuild to be in the hands of the 
people of Haiti and the Haitian diaspora in this country who actually know what needs to be done as opposed to siphoning off, if I may use that term, um, official government assistance. Not that there isn't, you know, a role for the United States government to play in in um, rebuilding that country, but perhaps the most effective thing that we as individuals can do if we're not gazillionaires is make a donation to one of the organizations that is um, um, led and managed by um, people who know the Haitian community and, and are part of the diaspora. Um, I'd like to return to um, Evanston now. And again, I advise people, if you want to ask a question, put it in the chat. We have about 25 minutes left of our allotted time. Going back to your service as a public official in Evanston and as a community leader, particularly looking at your service on the city council over several terms, what are you um, proudest of in terms of your contributions and your service on the Evanston City Council? Well, thank you. You're for, allowed to brag. Thank you for that question. But before I go there, let me just say that as a judge, I cannot ask you. We, I'm not asking for donation. That's <laughs> so, why I asked. That's why I asked. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real, real issue with uh, you know the judiciary cannot get involved in that kind of um, uh, area of discussion. But thank you. Uh, but. As a member of the city council, I would say I'm most proud of the work I did to um, help establish a, a youth and young adult uh, division um, of the city. Um, you know, the, the young people coming through our hands, you know, we win or lost the fight for them in the family and in the institutions that are supposed to be educating them to turn them into productive individuals. And uh, the city um, was involved in many different things, but did not have a, an area of concentration on the young people. And so many were falling through the cracks. And the most attention that we paid to young people in the city of Evanston was through our police force. Um, and um, we needed to have greater intervention, greater support um, to give them access to alternatives. Uh, not everybody was um, doing well in school or did well in school. If they graduated and didn't go away to school, uh, many floundered. And so that work, and I'm happy to say that that division is still in existence today. And so um, I cannot tell you the measure of success, but the fact that the institution continued to exist is, is a great thing. Um, there were many battles that we fought on the city council. And um, I think that you had mentioned beginning to put out the call uh, for uh, the city to throw its, its hat in the ring in the fight for reparation. The city of Evanston has put out, you know, has passed resolution of being, uh, you know, a nuclear free town, has, you know, taken position against the Iraq war and various other progressive initiatives. Uh, but um, the issue of reparation, which is a fundamental kind of resetting the course of this country, recognizing the, its, its enrichment at the cost and detriment of African-Americans, that it needed to begin to turn its attention at um, looking to see how it may be able to get involved. Um, I had um, participated in a conference in Durban, South Africa against colonialism, racism, and other forms of isms. And uh, one of the conclusions that we came out with was that colonialism 
slavery, colonialism, and the slave trade were crimes against humanity. And as such, reparation needed to uh, be repaid to fix, to heal, to remedy um, the ills that we had committed. And so coming out of um, the, the conference, when I came to, uh, before the city council, um, at that time, Jan Tchaikovsky, many professors from the Northwestern and um, unanimously the city, members of the city council stood up and they supported a resolution that I had proposed to um, support uh, HR 40, House Rule 40, which was proposed by um, Congressman Conyers from the 80s. Every year he would reintroduce it and it was not getting any traction, but the city of Evanston um, threw its weight behind it and called for the support. And our local Congress people uh, were supportive. We also called for uh, comprehensive education um, on about America. American history is made up of all of us being part of it. Um, and so we were, we didn't have authority, the city did not have authority over the district schools, but we wanted to, um, that was a persuasive kind of uh, call and we, we took the resolution and we sent it to all, the, all of the institutions, including the university, to say that we have to engage in a process of trying to um, really create human beings who understood where we came from and where we need to go. Uh, speaking about uh, education at ETHS, I was when I was at ETHS, um, myself, Hecky Powell, and many others, uh, we participated in taking over the superintendent's uh, office to demand Black history be taught. Um, and it was in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, we had many mentors because Northwestern University and uh, many others were standing up for social justice and equity in the nation. So we had called for that. And, um, you know, we did eventually begin to, and not only at that level, um, but also it's not about just content, but also bringing the teachers, uh, even at the city, uh, when, um, we were raising the issue of reparation and working in the various committees. We also call for equity, not only in terms of business, in terms of how resources were distributed, but also the staffing. You know, um, you can't have a city that was almost, you know, 15%, 20% um, African American. And then, you know, you had to really search for anybody in position of authority, majority of folks who were working there were working in, in lower rungs. And, you know, we had a mayor, a black mayor. Uh, we've had a history of a black police chief in, in the city and black uh, fire chief. So, you know, many things had to be addressed. Uh, I also waged a fight for the fire department to begin to recruit. Uh, and integrate is, is, is force. Because at some point when I got there, it had been 10 years since they had hired a black fireman. So it, it's a multiplicity of issues um, because again, I come from a background that, you know, there's no limitation to what an individual can do uh, because of race, color, creed, you know, all of us have the potential. In fact, my position is if you born healthy, you, you, you gifted already, you know, and if you not healthy, you have some gifts anyway. So the limitation and the, the, the anytime you see a society where there's inequities, you have uh, uh, gaps in, in educational uh, attainment, um, you have, greater percentage of people going to prison because of their, their color. Uh, you have to look deeper and address 
the inequity and you have to raise your voice. So we can't be, we can't walk in the rain and not get wet. We have to, to be about, we have to be about the business of bringing about a better society. And it is, it doesn't fall from the sky. It is, we make it happen. So yeah. I enjoy Absolutely. the council <laughs> and, you know, I had great colleagues here. Uh, you told me yesterday when we talked that um, former alderman, um, your predecessor in the Second War, Dennis Drummer, had been kind of a mentor to you and had encouraged you to run for the office. There's a question in the chat um, asking, would you recommend the aldermanic path to other people of color who want to make a difference? And what would you tell them about your experience as alderman? I mean, it seems to me that you've you've trod both paths. You are an elected official who took responsibility for, you know, decision making and advocacy within government, but you also have served as an activist outside of government um, to bring about change. So, you seem to be a person who's comfortable in both places. Well, but what advice would you give to a younger person who might be considering serving? elective office in Evanston? Well, I would say to these young people, whether they're black, white, or indifferent, to get engaged in your neighborhood, in your block, and uh, make a difference. Make sure it's safe, it's clean. And you know, get to know people, get to know their interests, and become an individual who um, folks can can look at as an option to to help um, advance the interests of the community. In my block, in my neighborhood, we had uh, the Canal Park Neighbors, which was led by um, Betty Payne, who was uh, a president of the township. Um, Betty uh, led our community organization for um, 34 years, selfless mm -hmm. calling meetings um, when we had urgencies, calling meetings when we needed to just get together and talk to one another. And uh, Betty wanted to make sure that we got services to this part of town. And remember, uh, this part of town was closest to, to the, to the uh, canal that was not viewed as a as a good part of town from the standpoint of value. Um, you know, our park needed attention, our street, you know, it was a history of, you know, it was paving the streets. We were last to have gotten that kind of service. So Betty um, pulled us together consistently, made demands. And when we, um, we're facing the kind of uh, convulsion that any community might face where young people were growing up in the community and they were doing their thing and it was not consistent with the peace and tranquility of the older members of the community. We were able to organize and go sit down and talk to them to try to see if we can get them to understand our perspective um, and uh, there was a slogan that we developed. Uh, at some point, we even marched in the community and we created a t-shirt called Nosy Neighbors, uh, where we were uh, involved in, you know, making sure that our community was safe, it was stable. And um, we had great people in our community, such as Chief Logan, uh, who had made significant contribution in um, building, as I said, the first black police chief who had built the um, the the uh, organization, the Chessman Club, and national organizations of blacks and law enforcement. Uh, so mm -hmm. we continued to, and it wasn't because of special skill. I was always somebody who was involved in activism anyway in uh, trying to push stuff forward. So I would say to young people, get engaged at your local immediate neighborhood level, but don't leave, don't limit your aspiration to being an alderman only. Uh, in the city of Evanston, 
uh, we have not yet ran for, you know, state senator and state Congress people and U.S. Congress folks. So, you know, it's all available to all of us to stretch out and find a way to serve um, the community. Automatic is a good way to start too. Great, thank you. Um, there are two issues currently on the league's agenda that I'd like to get your take on in the time we have left. Um, one is um, criminal justice reform. And I know that you've been involved, I believe at the request of the police department itself here in restorative justice, but a specific um, specific uh, reforms on the agenda now, which you may want to address is elimination of cash bail is one. Um, is it going to be, give us a more just system? Will it have an impact on public safety in Evanston and elsewhere? And another one is um, electronic monitoring. As a judge, do you think electronic monitoring um, uh, provides the right balance between the rights of an individual to be released from jail and the rights of the community to be protected um, during that time. Anything you'd like to say about either of those issues? Well, when we talked about it, I did tell you that there's, uh, you know, the division of um, balance of power in any of the governmental uh, uh, entities in the United States is that, you know, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, you know, the judiciary uh, normally doesn't take a uh, stance on policies that are e evolving um, that may turn into laws because eventually uh, some of these issues may come before us to determine whether or not they are legal, constitutional, or otherwise. But having said that, um, I would say to you that bail, the purpose of bail is not, you know, in the United States, the in many areas of high concentration of working class and black folks and people of color, um, the tendency is to use bail as a punitive um, tool. Um, as opposed to, um, because bail is supposed to ensure that an individual returns to court. So to the extent that that individual is rooted in the community, um, is able to uh, return um, to court, is not a risk of flight, you know, there, there's the point of departure. Now, you know, depending on the gravity of the crime, uh, will determine what a judge will or will not do. But the consciousness of this kind of measure and what it is for help us understand um, how to apply it. Uh, so um, it's not uh, uh, a question of a uniformity because the whole notion of criminal justice system by the way, I don't know whether any of you have read the, the new Jim Crow, um, which is a book um, by, um, I forgot the name of the author, but uh, it's called Mass Incarceration and New Jim Crow uh, that talks about that. A very good book. <laughs> yeah, almost every, um, almost, you know, 60% of Blacks, um, are either on parole, uh, either have had some kind of brush with the criminal justice system, uh, that uh, people's lives are stunted um, because of, remember the whole war on drugs and for marijuana, you could spend you know, a significant amount of your life in jail, but yet now we're making plenty of money off of it. Um, you know, so the issue of, and we waste, it's, it's really the inequities that move us into a, a direction 
that people live outside of the law. Um, the, and, it's, and it's really unfortunate because if you look at the international, we talk about race with China and the rest, of, they, they're focusing on, on teaching their, their young to, to, to sharpen their, their, their minds, their skills, to be able to contribute to society. Here, you know, we're more preoccupied in the school system in managing um, behavior. And a lot of our kids are hyper-controlled um, because they are, their creativity or their energy um, take them to, to challenge uh, certain um, approaches and they need more attention. Um, but too many of our, our kids are falling through the cracks. Too many of our kids are having confrontation or engagement with the police. Um, so, and too many end up in jail. So it is a broad issue of criminal justice reform that this society has to look at to see how do we, how do we raise our young why do we warehouse so many of our uh, people uh, who are poor, who are Black, uh, who are working class in these jails? Um, and why do we police different communities differently? I'm, you know, I see every judge when you get started in Cook County, you in the, the traffic division first. And you know, these little pendants that you, these little uh, uh, deodorizers that you might hang in front of your, your visor. Well, in certain communities, there were people were getting stopped. That was probable cause. Right. To stop you so that they can, you know, figure out whether or not, <laughs> you know, you ought to be free. Um, I don't see anybody around this community being stopped like that. Um, and so there's a difference in terms of approach. Um, and I think that the broad philosophical, you know, approach of control, uh, limitation, and which is being manifested today in terms of the whole fight for the votes and stuff like that. Um, we cannot, in this society, compete on an international level in the next 30, 40 years if throwing away and warehousing so many of our citizens. So it's a way, roundabout way to say to you that we've got to look at what we do. It's not what's closest to our noses that we need to pay attention to, but we need to look at the strategic kind of uh, impact of what we do in the society with the, the the least among us, the, the most, the, those who are poor, those who are black, those who are Hispanics. Um, thank you, thank you for those those cogent observations and and advice. Uh, one more question before we have to adjourn. Another issue that the league in Evanston is looking at is health equity, and we are wondering. Um, do you see particular issues associated with health equity um, in the Haitian community in Evanston and in the community at large, for that matter? Um, access to health care, access to um, insurance coverage. Um, of course, all of this is now complicated by COVID, but, but is health equity a major concern in the um, Haitian community? Well. I would say that, let me start by saying, we have a particular problem right now with those who are undocumented uh, accessing healthcare. Um, they may come in and many had walked miles through forests to try to get here, walk through water and um, get here. It's difficult to get to the various agencies that provide healthcare. Uh, to see these human beings uh, unless, you know, they could show insurance. Um, so 
is 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 manifesting itself sharply with these migrants who uh, just come in as we try to get them service, but it's also manifesting itself with others in our community who uh, may not have had a, a full time job. Uh, they may have been working as a, a, a CNA somewhere as a as as a part time worker. They may have been you know. A, a bit worker. There may be a lot of, of the Haitians in the community were taxi drivers. Um, you know, so it's been difficult for them to get uh, to pay for insurance. Insurance has been expensive and it's been difficult for them to um, get access to health care on a consistent basis. Certainly, many people go to uh, uh, Stroger Hospital. Um, to get health care, but it's been, no, there's not universal <laughs> access to health care. Uh, our, one of our local organizations, Haitian American Nurses Association, have been one of the members of our coalition have been uh, um, trying to point the way uh, to some of the individuals who have needed to get access to health care. But, um, no, it's we know that uh, it's not there's no public access. It's, it's you know you got to pay. Yes. Anything else you'd like to add? What I've what should I have asked you that I haven't asked you? <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that, Maybe I should ask your daughter what I should have asked you. <laughs> <laughs> My proud daughter is a licensed um, social worker who helps a bunch of people. She's at the barricades too, trying to make sure that uh, healthcare of um, predominantly youth, young adolescent uh, being addressed. Um, but I think that uh, the issue is really one of, um, we need to stay engaged, people. Uh, we cannot. We cannot just observe the world. We've got to fight to change it, and so it means engagement. It means getting involved in 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 doing stuff, like when Larry retires as uh, a commissioner. You know, we still going. We still going to have to, you know, call on Larry to to help out, like he's historically done. Um, it's really more of a question of that we've got to, you know, live a life worth following, that others see us doing, that our kids learn to do, and we got to teach. You know. Um, we have an hour and we be passive in our fight to bring about change. It's it just not going to come passively. And we can't be, we have to be careful, but we can't be scared to represent uh, that which are the values that uh, we say we stand for. The League of Women Voters have always been on the cutting edge of the fight for the right to vote. I mean, what are we gonna do, people? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do in Wisconsin? What are we gonna do in, 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 in Pennsylvania? What are we gonna do in Georgia? What are we gonna do? And we know that in Illinois, um, you know, before we give it an inch, you know, we're going to fight like crazy. But this is the period of time when we have to continue to make a difference. And with the technology, we could reach Georgia, we could reach um, North Carolina, South Carolina, we could, we could stay engaged. So it's about really making a difference. We can't, we can't get a different world by wishing that it would come. 
So this this that's what I would say. And well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just wrote down a, my take. One of my takeaways from this evening: live a life worth following. And I think that is a um, testament to what you have done and continue to do and what you told us about your daughter. Um, obviously, the apple, apple isn't falling very far from the tree. And we uh, thank you for your um, sharing your, your time with us this evening. And um, I would, again, while we're still on, uh, people, if you haven't gone to the chat yet to see the information from the Haitian coalition, and perhaps, Mary, we can send that out to people who were um, registered for this event. Any closing comments you need to make, Mary? Unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Helen. It's been a, uh, power, a, a powerhouse of education for me uh, in terms of the judge's sharing of his rich history and understanding of the geopolitical climate, et cetera. So thank you very much, Judge. On behalf of the League, we will continue to fight for voting rights. That I assure you. Good. OK, Good. well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Judge John baptiste for your wisdom, your service and your candor. I appreciate that. All right. We Thank are you. adjourned. We are. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay.